Number 25, Kataya versus Board of Managers of 160 slash 170 Barrack Street. Council? May it please the court, my name is Michael Cazores from the law office of James J. Toomey, and I represent Trinity Church in Machili. I respectfully request three minutes for rebuttal. Three minutes? Yes. You may, sir. Many of your honors are familiar with uh, this case, not only from the briefs, but many of you were here at, at the last oral argument. I would just reiterate that we're not asking for any radical relief here. We're simply asking uh, this court to bring the first department into conformity with the other three appellate departments and with this court's decision in, in Nazario. In, in this case, we have a, a gentleman who fell from a ladder after having received an electrical shock. Because he had received the electrical shock, he was awarded summary judgment on his 241-6 claim, and we haven't disputed that. The issue in this case is whether the ladder was defective or whether it provided adequate protection. There's no evidence, or at least credibly, uh, credible evidence in dispute, that the ladder was inadequate. There's very little evidence, or at least conflicting evidence, as to whether the ladder moved, slipped, fell at all. Uh, Justice um, Judge Rivera had a question at the last oral argument where she was concerned about what difference did it make between well, what la ladder Mr. Renna saw on the floor and what ladder that the, the plaintiff was, was using at the time. And I just want to emphasize that the importance of that distinction is that it's, it's compelling evidence that the ladder that Mr. Renna saw on the floor, which one may presume is the ladder plaintiff was using and fell, was not in fact the ladder that the plaintiff was using at the time of the accident. Uh, there, there's evidence that there was more than one ladder in the room. There's evidence that the ladder that plaintiff was using did not fall and that the ladder that Mr. Renna saw after the accident on the floor was not in fact the ladder that the plaintiff was using, which would mean that the ladder did not slip, did not fall. What evidence is that? Sorry, over here. Okay. What, what evidence is that? The evidence is that the plaintiff has no idea how he got on the floor. No, no, I mean, I'm sorry. Oh, okay, maybe, go ahead. He has no idea how he got on the floor. He couldn't recall what position the ladder was in after he fell. He couldn't recall if the ladder moved while he was on it. So that's sort of not evidence. Well, right? it's not evidence in support of his claim that the ladder fell. It's not evidence of anything. It I mean, becomes... He, he, has it, no memory. It, it becomes an issue when we bring Mr. Renna into the picture and he testified that he saw a ladder on the floor within a few minutes after the accident. Uh, a lot of the attorneys in the case were operating throughout the depositions on, on the assumption, well, that that was the ladder that, that the plaintiff was using and it must have fell. But that ladder is incredibly different in description from the ladder that plaintiff himself was using. The ladder that Mr. Renna saw on the floor certainly did not meet the description of the ladder that the plaintiff said he was using. And no one could remember if there was a ladder that fit that description the that counsel, plaintiff was using that was still erect. Counsel, shouldn't you focus on what the plaintiff said when he began to do his work? That is what he had to do in order to use that ladder? What he said about what? He indicated what? that this was the ladder that he had to put in a position that it wasn't locked and he had to manipulate it in order to reach the area to do the work. Right. There's no question that the ladder was not used properly. And so what's the difference what ladder it is? Let's assume for purposes of this argument just for right now that it is the ladder. Is that fatal to your case? It, it would be fatal at the time of trial. If a jury determines that that was the ladder on the floor, then that's a 2 4 So your damage. argument before this court is in its entirety that that wasn't the ladder he was using. And that's the question of fact you I'm want saying to that there's that there's credible evidence in dispute which could go either way 
as to whether that ladder that was seen on the floor was the ladder that he was using. And the that's the only issue of fact you think is here? Yes. I, if, if the ladder, if, if the ladder, even if the ladder wasn't used properly, if the ladder didn't fall as a result of the improper use, then there's then no proximate cause. What's the difference which ladder it is? I mean, I'm having trouble even understanding what the relevance of the la which ladder it is is to your argument. Because to me, it seems like there's a ladder. It's leaning against the wall. We accept it's not being used in its full open and, and locked position. He falls from a ladder to the floor after being electrocuted. What difference does it make which ladder it is? Because there's no, because the ladder did not fail him. It was not defective and it was not, it was not shown to be inadequate for the task that he was performing because he was thrown from the ladder oh, wait, wait, by the on, electric shock. I mean, it's an A-frame ladder. It's meant to be used open and locked, right? And it's uncontroverted, I think, that he used it folded and leaned up against a wall, which you're not supposed to do, because that was the only way he could reach the place he had to work on. Is, that, is there contrary evidence? We don't dispute that. Okay. However, the fact that the ladder wasn't opened, if the ladder fell because it wasn't used properly and wasn't opened, then that's a, that's a 240 case as a matter of law. But if the ladder wasn't used properly and that improper use had no bearing on the accident, if it didn't cause him to fall to the floor after he had the electric shock, then how he used the ladder is irrelevant. But, uh, Council, I'm, sorry, that, I'm, really, I'm, I'm, sorry. I'm just having some trouble understanding then what is the difference between if it's a blue ladder or if it's a silver ladder. I mean, the question seems to me, the ladder's use leans up against the wall. The question, I think, I thought, was, is it the electric shock that sends him flying off the ladder and no ladder would have made any difference? Or is it a defective ladder or a combination of some of those things? So again, what difference does the actual ladder make to that analysis? Because it's, 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 com it's conflicting evidence as to whether or not the ladder that the plaintiff was using failed him. If the ladder, f if the ladder fell as a result of him being shocked, then that's a 240 case. If the ladder did not fall as a result of him being shocked and stayed erect and in the same position as he set it up in, then the ladder was not inadequate for the task he was performing. Well, to get back to your opening statement where you asked the court to, to bring this case in line with Nazario, are you saying in Nazario, uh, the, the question of whether or not the ladder fell, how does that relate to what happened in that case? It goes to proximate cause as to whether or not any defect or inadequacy of the latter was the proximate cause of the plaintiff's accident in this case. I, I always read Nazario as questioning proximate cause because of the electric shock that preceded the fall, not as a question of whether a ladder was open or closed. Am I misreading the case? No. The, the issue is whether or not the electric shock was the cause of the accident or the fall from the ladder or, or both. It's a matter of proximate cause. And it could it's be both, right? Sorry. It could be both. It could be both. Okay. But in this case, there's disputed evidence as to whether or not it was a height-related issue but versus... But in Nazario, there was no expert offered by the plaintiff, correct? In Nazario? Correct. Nazario didn't offer an expert. Here, plaintiff offered an expert. He, yes. With here. respect to how the accident happened and whether he was provided with a proper safety device. But the ex plaintiff's expert in this case never visited the work site. He also opined as to whether or not the, the voltage that he sustained, the but shock. The plaintiff's expert looked at the record. It considered depositions and the like, the size of the room, et cetera, and the defendant offered no expert whatsoever. But there's, there's, no, there's no testimony as to, as to the size of the space. We have the plaintiff's testimony that he tried to open the ladder in the space and that he could not. The expert never visited the site. The expert opined that, that a, a scaffold could possibly 
have prevented this accident, which is speculative. Plus, we have a subsequent decision by the first department that said that a scaffold under the same set of circumstances was not sufficient. Thank you, Council. Thank you. Council? Good afternoon, Your Honor. Louis Grandelli for the plaintiffs. Um, what Mr. Kazoris just said about there's evidence that there was one, more than one ladder in that room is complete speculation with absolutely no support whatsoever in the record. One important thing that I didn't really discuss last year when we argued this case is after this accident, not only did Joe Renner, the defendant's project manager, find a folded ladder right under the exposed wire where Cutea was working, right in the pipes in the far end of the room where he had to fold it to angle it to reach that area, the, um, his helper told Mr. Renner right away the ladder slid from under him. Cutea is taken to the hospital after that. He never goes back to the scene. The defendants conducted a full investigation into this incident. They did an accident report, which wasn't authenticated, but they attempted to find out what happened. No one would authenticate the statements in there, but there were people listed as witnesses, including uh, Mr. Alonzo and certain other people that were present at the scene. Uh, they took a picture. Mr. Reddit took a picture of the exposed wire because he wanted to shift any liability to the electrical contractor. But the point is, they never found any other ladder in that room. All so, the testimony so counsel, you have- I, 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 take that, I take that point. It seemed to me that the, the bigger issue here was someone's working and there is a, a shock. So what if someone's working up there and there's an explosion? I know this isn't the case, but there's, and he's blown off the ladder. Is that a, is that a 240 claim? No, so you, you had asked me last year, uh, Judge Garcia, about what happened if the floor collapsed. Oh, yeah. And, right. and, I, and I flubbed that question. And I, I walked around for a week talking to myself. Well, how did I do that? That would be an unforeseeable event. <laughs> that was a better event. one. Yeah, what happened to the floor? That would be an unforeseeable event. That wouldn't be the normal anticipated danger in the work that he's doing. And the same thing with the explosion. That would be an extraordinary event attenuated for the, from the foreseeable risks inherent in what Cutea was doing. Cutea is working in the ceiling. He could not use the ladder in the open and intended fashion with the safety clips locked. We all know that. By their own admission to Judge Wilson, he said, he admitted, that, Mr. Kuzorf, that this was an inadequate safety device. But is there a causation issue in that respect? Because let's say the, the ladder was open and locked. Same facts we have here, different ladder facts, right? He could, he could open and lock the ladder. Same facts, shock, fall. Is that a claim for that you get this judgment for? All right, so in Nazario, you know what's interesting, Judge Tom gave a lengthy uh, decision. It was concurrence here, you know, more yeah. like a dissent. But he said, not only was the ladder being used in its intended purpose, and not only was there no record evidence of the need for another device, he talks about cases, Israel Love from this court, from the 1980s, which was an electric shock case, where a worker fell off a ladder, and Quackenbush was a second department case, where he says, we need some record evidence that this device was insufficient, which they admit that it was insufficient, or a record evidence for another device, perhaps from an expert. My expert reviewed all the evidence in the case, as, as Justice Tra Trautman said, and Judge, Judge Trautman, you had a case uh, just last August, while you were on the fourth department, uh, Miller, where a similar case, where the plaintiff established a prima facie case, through a submission of an expert affidavit, and the defendants failed to rebut that, and you found that there was no question of fact, and it was summary judgment for the plaintiff. But, but how do we know it's, this is what it boils down to me, even my hypotheticals, how do we know it's the latter and not just the shock? Okay, so I get the whole point. There's a Higgins case that's discussed in the briefs. If there's a shock that is such great force that it would knock someone across the room and propel them, then I get the argument that that could potentially be the sole proximate cause of the accident, and the accident would have happened no matter what device the person was on. That's not the case here. This was 110 volts. Their project manager said, I get shocked by 110 volts all the time. It doesn't really you know, cause any major injuries. If that's all that but, happened but to- But counsel, to, isn't the record that he doesn't remember, the plaintiff doesn't remember what happened after the electric shock? And, and I think maybe even that he conceded that it's possible he could have been launched by the shock. No, so that's, that's I'm sorry, Your Honor, that, that, that's incorrect. What he says is he remembers the, sh the shock. He doesn't remember falling to the ground. He remembers being on the ground. 
two to five feet from where he was working, which is completely inconsistent with any propulsion theory, any thrust theory, anything like in Higgins, where is a first department case, where the worker was thrust across the room, where is a question whether or not a scaffold or a, a lift or any le uh, device would have protected him. Another thing in this right. case, How can you make that statement if, if his testimony is, I simply don't recall anything after? I remember the electrical shock, but nothing after that. Okay, because he only is, is a few feet from where he was working. So he wasn't propelled across the room, and it's just 110 volts. And you also have the statement from Alonzo, the spontaneous statement at the scene, that the lattice slid from under him. So this Council, if I can interrupt you, I'm, I'm on the screen. Yes, Hello. Sir. Okay, so I, I'm going to ask why this matters in the same way we started out with this conversation. Why, why does it matter whether or not that ladder that they found on the, on the floor is, is the ladder that, um, uh, that he fell off? So I thought I heard you say that if he was thrown off by this electrical shock, that depending on the type of electrical shock, and that there's no, no safety device that would have prevented that, then the labor law doesn't protect that. Am, am I understanding you correctly? Well, 241.6, which is what we have, that, that would protect them. There's industrial code section to deal with electrical shocks. However, they could... Well, why, well, why, no, no. Why doesn't 241? No, but what, if, if indeed there is no adequate safety device... Doesn't then the risk of an injury and the cost uh, under the labor law, isn't that what the legislature decided, fall on the employer, not on the employee? I mean, the, the employer can decide it's so risky, nothing is going to protect them from the shock and they're doing electrical work, right? I've, I've got to come up with something else, well, some other way to do the electrical work rather than imperil my employee's health and life. Well, he actually wasn't, he wasn't doing electrical work. So it, a lot of the cases you have in front of you, Nazario, and many of the cases that... Yes, but he's in an area with wiring. One yes. must understand so that the potential is there. He, he, he's a plumber, an, an un, unlicensed, non-OSHA trained plumber. He's doing plumbing work, cutting pipes. There's live electricity in the room, but no indication that there is a live circuit. All right, but so if I'm just understanding you, I'm sorry to interrupt you again. Your point is, if there is no adequate safety device... That, that might not be 241, but it's covered by, by some other labor law provision. Is that what you're saying? Electrical shocks, are, there's industrial code sections that deal with electrical hazards in, in the workplace. 240 is completely different, it's different analysis, and there's maybe 20 cases that you have in front of you where a worker gets shocked on, uh, by electricity, whether on a ladder or a scaffold, and the inquiry always is, in every case, and here, was the device counsel? adequate? Here, how many um, elevation risks was he exposed to? So, I mean, one, one risk is he has to fold up the ladder. So now the ladder is not like Nazario. It's not an open A-frame ladder that's stable. It's, it's an unsecured ladder. By folding it and leaning it, that ladder is not secured. He has to, he's soldering, so there's a flame. He has to use uh, hand tools to cut copper pipes. Solder, just use the tools from his hand belt to do the work. All that is dangerous, and that's why this court has said in Rokovich and Runner that elevation height differentials pose uh, an extraordinary risk to workers, and that's why 240 exists. If he had just gotten a 110-volt shock, he would have been back to work the next week. It's only because he fell from that ladder, because the ladder failed to protect him from falling to the ground, and he needed five operations, that he couldn't go back to work. Let me, let me um, switch subjects for a minute and ask you something about the appellate division's decision. I assume you'd like us to affirm, right? Excuse me, I'm you, sorry? You would like us to affirm? <laughs> yes, okay, very so much let's so. just start there. So there's a, there's a sentence in the appellate division's decision that says the following. Plaintiff suffered not only electrical burns, but injuries to his spine and shoulders that necessitated multiple surgeries and are clearly attributable to the fall and not to the shock, presenting questions of fact as to damages, but not liability. Yes. So were we to affirm, what do you understand that, that sentence would mean for the balance of your proceeding? What, what that means is if you were to affirm that there's a finding that 240 is violated, but I still have to go to trial and prove that the injuries, the surgeries that you tell you had were causally related to the incident. And I think that's from an O'Leary case. I and, think that's and, where right. and the, they, and the they got that. So and, I would, they, the defendants are still free to argue at trial that he hurt himself playing football, or these the degenerative well, or, in nature. Or the, I still have to prove those free, Are they free to argue that the electrical burns are not proximately caused by the fall? 
I don't think there's any question that the electrical burn, that's a 241.6, that's already been established. It's the question here is whether the, the orthopedic injuries, the injuries from falling, were due to a 240 violation. The 240 violation, which in front of this court, even if I win that, I still have to prove at trial the nature, you know, that the, the in, that the injuries themselves were connected to that violation. To the fall, or could you also prove the burns? Well, it's, it's due to both. It's, it's just like we discussed. Let's do, do, it's the, just like the Gordon case. There were two proximate causes of this accident: the electricity, which precipitated him shaking and the failure to provide an adequate safety device, which is the other proximate cause of the accident. All we need to show is that the violation was a contributing cause of the incident. Thank you, counsel. Counsel, Thank you, Your, your rebuttal. Yes. Your Honors, Mr. Grandelli opened his, his statement by saying that there's no evidence whatsoever that there was any other than just one ladder in that room. That's completely inaccurate. I, I refer you to page 1796 of the record that was uh, presented to the first department, which this court has. There's a photograph that clearly shows more than one ladder in the room. One of the ladders appears to be a 10-foot blue fiberglass A-frame ladder. Uh, also, Mr. Grandelli said that Mr. Alonzo, the plaintiff's helper, said that the ladder slipped. Well, that's not accurate. We get that statement from Mr. Renna himself, who said that Mr. Alonzo told me that the ladder slipped. However, the same day of the accident, there's an incident report whereby Mr. Alonzo indicated that he did not witness the accident. When we took Mr. Alonzo's deposition, he had no recollection of any details whatsoever of the accident. This statement that the ladder slipped is merely Mr. Renner's uh, recollection of what someone told him who admittedly did not witness the accident. Here, you know, we have, uh, the plaintiff said that he was electrocuted and that he has electrical burns. This is in stark contrast to the argument he's making now that this was some minor electrical shock and that he would have been back to work a week later given the voltage. Throughout this entire case, he, he, he complained about how he went to the hospital with electrical burns, that he went, was shot off the ladder and with such force that he couldn't remember what happened. All of this is, is in the record and is contrary to Mr. Grandelli's rendition of the facts. Um, you know, I, it's our position that this case falls squarely under uh, Naz, uh, Nazario, and that if, if the court does not reverse, then I don't see how, how uh, Nazario isn't also reversed. I don't see any distinguishing factors in this case uh, that could justify uh, a, a, an affirmance of the First Department that is not contrary to Nazario. Thank you, counsel. Thank you.